Hey, coming up right now, it's the turbulent truth of why flight attendants actually sit on their hands during takeoff and landing. We're going to tell you how and why they do that. Also coming up, Oprah is breaking up. No, not with her longtime partner, Stedman, oh. but with Weight Watchers, why they decided to part ways. Oprah. All right, a little bit later on, CNN staffers outrage after finding out what fired anchor Don Lemon received as his final paycheck. Golly, if all final paychecks can <laughs> be that right? way. Daily Flash starts right now. Get ready for trending news and entertainment. This is Daily Flash with your hosts, Andrea Jackson and Mitch English. The fun starts right now. This is Daily Flash. Jackson. I am Mitch English, welcoming you to the big show, Daily Flash. We've got a fantastic show mm -hmm. all lined up, ready to rock for you, and uh, we're very happy to have you here. I'm not sure if uh, you know about what's going on, but I have an Etsy shop that I sell uh, peacock uh, uh, feathers for, <laughs> and I got sold out this weekend. No yeah, way. It's Matt, what's going on, buddy? My whole house is full of peacock feathers. <laughs> My whole house. <laughs> My whole house is full tell of peacock everybody, feathers. Tell everybody why. This is, this I, I don't have an Etsy shop. Right? It's part of the wedding because yeah. uh, peacock feathers. So he's got all these leftover peacock feathers. Now there's leftover the wedding, peacock feathers. It. There's peacock feathers everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, when he comes in this morning, ah, ah, I got peacock feathers all over my house. I was not consulted on the peacock feathers, and then there's peacock feathers. Yeah. Does this change the course of your marriage going forward? Just a lot of peacocking. Just a little okay. Peacocking. Well, yeah. peacocking. Which all was right. what we were doing at the wedding. It was very nice, right? <laughs> I, I love see, it. I see. Well, congratulations, yes, Matt. Thank you. Yes, Matt. Now a married man. Married man with a house full, full of, peacocks. of peacock feathers. The cat's trying to eat them. That's the oh problem. Boy. The cat's trying to eat them. Nothing better than cleaning up cat vomit. Uh, yeah. Full of peacock feathers. That, that, sen that sentence, uh, peacock, the cat trying to go after the peacock feathers, is going to mean something totally different <laughs> <laughs> like about three, four months from now when you this guys are a, looking for some This is a PG-13 show, exactly. by the way. P.S. Exactly. Well, that's why I said I leave yes. it to them you at home. To use your let imagination. You exactly. What's okay. going on, Jackson? Wendy's, remember we talked about this, their whole price yeah, surging yeah, 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 program? Yeah, yeah. Well, it backfired on them. They backpedaled, and they're like, well, it's flexible pricing. We're not going to do surge pricing. It's more just flexible pricing so that, you know, if there are better bargains throughout the day, we'll focus on those. Well, of course, they got walloped by Burger King. They came out and offered all sorts of deals, lots of criticism. Now, Wendy's has come forward and said, look, for March, we're going to offer dollar burgers and okay. two dollar burgers as a special for March Madness. March Madness. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, if you have followed, do you follow... Do you follow Wendy's on, uh, on on social media? On Twitter, they're pretty funny. That's the thing. They yes. have somebody, and she misspells everything. She's and terrific, whoever she is, so, or he. Uh, I don't that, know. The, their, their team, whoever's yeah. doing that. And so initially, when I heard this, I was thinking that was part of it. Like, this is a joke. But they yeah. were dead serious about this, yeah. as you mentioned. And I, I would, to me, it with the whole thing about the surge pricing or whatever, I would not go. I would say, well, I know they're going to be more expensive right now. I'll just go to Burger King. Right. Why would they even, you know what I'm saying? Like, what what would it motivate me want to go there during the times where I would be hungry right on lunchtime? Why would I want to pay There's more? There's no benefit because if you're thinking, right. okay, if it's the height of lunchtime, you're going to charge me $10 for a burger when you would have charged me $2 for a burger at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Exactly. So Why like, would I go to lunch there? I'll yeah. choose someplace else. And I think, I don't know if it was one of those things that just wasn't well thought through or if the marketing department sort of messed up in their wording or what it was, but it was not sold very well. And now they're doing the major back. Shareholders not happy. Yeah, no. but, uh, all right, let's jump into the show. Although they are called the friendly skies, jet setting off into the clouds sometimes actually results in a bumpy ride. Mm -hmm. However, when that trouble is brewing, there is actually one go-to position for our flight attendants who actually claim it's a lifesaver. Check this out. Ever wondered why cabin crew sits like this during takeoff and landing? It is called bracing position. This position involves fastening seatbelt securely, sit upright, sit on hands, palms up, thumbs tuck, and arms loose, and feet flat on the floor. The aim is to keep the body in a rigid pose so that if there was any 
any impact from an unplanned emergency. The body is damaged less. Interesting there. Online critics are actually stunned by that revelation, and many empathize with the dangers of job that actually involves constantly preparing for a crash, which people forget. They're, Jackson, you're waiting for a crash, I can tell. Uh, oh, just, it, it's just coming. In case. It's, no, it'll come. That's probably a good idea. It's happening. Uh, I've never actually seen him do that sort of thing. But I have. The, uh, yeah. now I, I guess, you know, and I, I, what I was saying earlier is that uh, flight attendants, people think that, oh, they're the waitresses in the sky, and that's not the case. They're there for your, your preparation uh, for any kind of danger. You've probably seen them do it. You just didn't realize maybe they were it doing was. it. Yeah, because they've, they, it's one of those moves where you're like, oh, maybe they're just, you know, getting comfortable, and it's one of those simple moves, but you don't think about it being life I'll do this when I get really nervous when there's bumpy weather, and I get it, and I go... <laughs> <laughs> I'm 50. I'm 50. <laughs> Mary Jo Gallagher. <laughs> well, Oprah Winfrey is stepping down from the board of Weight Watchers after nine years with the group. The media mogul revealed she will be donating her financial stake in the company to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Winfrey's decision comes just a few months after she revealed she was taking medication to lose weight, although she declined to name which one. She looks phenomenal. She's always looked great. In a press release, Weight Watchers noted that Winfrey's decision to donate her shares was a way to eliminate any conflict of interest around her taking weight loss medications, yeah. allowing Oprah's announcement, or following Oprah's announcement, I should say, stock and Weight Watchers tanked nearly 17%. Yeah, so I have a feeling that somebody else will step in and hopefully that'll help Weight Watchers regain some footing. Uh, I, I think, well, when you go and when you say, all right, I'm the Weight Watchers, it's almost like it's on you for life. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Because now they're gonna say, all right, because when, when you lose weight, people wanna say, what do you keep it off? You know, yes. that sort of thing. And so I can understand that. I, I kind of commend her as well saying now, I, for, for not saying what she, the, the drug that she takes, but I think like everybody's thinking, Right now, it's oh, oh, Ozempic, Zempic, right? Maybe it's not, maybe it is. But she also has the, the, the resources to actually get maybe drugs that are very expensive that could actually help out as well, whereas other people wouldn't have that option. Like the high octane Ozempic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> is there yeah, one that doesn't you know, maybe. hurt your body? Like or, the celebrity Ozempic yeah. that none of us you know, have access to. She, um, you know, knowing that if she ever mentioned that the, the stock and whatever that drug is, and everybody would start using it. It's the magic vote, That's who you she know. Is, right? It's like her favorite things list. You make that list, and you're pretty much set for life. You're on it. You're on it. All right, CNN staffers outraged and shocked to find out that fired anchor Don Lemon's actual final payout was twenty-five million dollars. What? A little salt, salt to the Don Lemon uh, yeah. wound. Employees found out their bonuses were now be cut by 20%. 57-year-old <laughs> Lemon axed from CNN after his controversial run wow. as a morning anchor. Lemon's oust uh, actually came two months after a number of public mistakes, including a mandatory apology after saying a 50-year-old Nikki Haley was past her prime in politics. <laughs> the veteran actor... Anchor, rather, uh, said that he was actor. actor. Okay, I'll yeah. use that as well. Said he was blindsided by CNN's oh. decision to cut ties. Lemon said that he only learned about his firing after getting a call from his agent, <laughs> which is not uncommon. No. Uh, it's better that way sometimes yeah. to find out through your agent. Uh, it, it's sad. Here's the thing, though, and I said it just on the back end when you hire somebody. Uh, you can't blame them for making the kind of money that they're making because right. you don't get paid what you're worth. You get paid what you negotiated. And he negotiated apparently that $25 million. Was it fair? No. Would uh, a nice gesture for him to, to like, hey, I'll buy you guys that only got 20%. I'll give you the rest of whatever. I'll buy you lunch at Wendy's. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, Wendy's lunch, yeah. Wendy's buy, at 2 o'clock. Yeah, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Which is the same <laughs> amount, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think you're absolutely right when it comes to Don Lemon. I mean, he's sort of, you know, been there, been there done that, right? And I think at this point in his life, he doesn't ever have to come back to television. Now, the real question right. is, does he miss it? Does he want to be back on oh, television? Oh, when's his podcast start? That, that's, oh, that's the next. Yes. That's always the next thing. Is yes. all these guys go get and start a podcast and, like and uh, Tucker Carlson? It also, if you think about it, since we're talking agents, to let this get out is actually a good thing because yeah. he goes, listen, you know, if, you know, you can tell how much money I was making at CNN. This is the deal that I that I made before. You're getting me at a steal for only ten million dollars. You know that sort yes. of thing. And he has a following. I, I, you know, like him or not. 
uh, he actually it, it gets into the news and he gets his, his it, we're talking about him right yeah, now. So there you go. Personality. Personality. There's no question. Right. Well, visitors to Yosemite National Park in California were treated to a rare phenomena when the sun's reflection on a waterfall created what's known as a firefall. Yosemite's horsetail fall becomes the firefall only a few times a year oh, when cool. the reflection of the sun makes the falling water look like flowing flames. The phenomena is tough to see as the waterfall is often shaded by clouds. However, one photographer captured this video during a recent visit to the park and posted his amazing That's footage neat. to YouTube. Not to be confused with uh, Waterwall. No, not at all. <laughs> we didn't follow that. Here's the thing. What a great job. Or oh, Wonderwall. I totally blew that joke. I, I knew where you were going with it, though. <laughs> it took me a second. But what a great job, like, going around and, like, chasing waterfalls. But TLC says, <laughs> don't go. Don't go Don't there. Go, Don't go. Don't go. All right. Firefalls. We will continue out the 90s here on Daily Flash. <laughs> uh, you stick around for that. Actually, we're going to be talking uh, just a moment about uh, your home and how Wall Street wants it and how actually, you know, your, your home is going to be more valuable than you actually realize. So do you want to hold on to it or not? Yeah, when you think about companies buying up entire neighborhoods, neighborhoods and what that does to the value of your property. We're talking about that right around the mm -hmm. corner. Stick around. More fun, trending news and entertainment right here on Daily <laughs> Flash. Man, we love having you here. You smell fantastic. <laughs> Welcome back to Daily Flash. I'm Andrea Jackson. In today's Financially Speaking, we are talking about money and real estate and how your chance to buy a home in the future could be diminishing by the minute. Here to explain why Wall Street might be buying up homes and neighborhoods is James Rodriguez with Business Insiders. He is senior real estate reporter for Business Insider. Welcome back. How are you doing this morning? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about this. What's Wall Street doing when it comes to the housing market? Is it a single family home that they're buying up or is it entire neighborhoods or maybe a little bit of both? Well, so what we saw during the pandemic is really investors got super interested in the residential real estate market. They were buying up single family homes around the country, particularly in the uh, Sun Belt area, the south uh, southern half of the U.S. there. And, and recently I've been writing about this deal where they're not only buying up homes outright, but they're, you also have a handful of investors that are offering these deals known as home equity investments, which is basically, we'll give you a lump sum of cash today in exchange, you give us a stake in your home and you know, 10, 20 or 30 years down the line, we can uh, settle up when you sell your home and, and they'll get a certain percentage of that sale price. So they're basically co-investing in your home alongside you. So, James, what are the pros and cons when it comes to using this home equity investment strategy? So the, the pros are really it's it's not a debt option. It's an, an equity option. And so, you know, you don't have your debt to income ratio affected. You also don't have monthly payments the way that, you know, traditionally when homeowners tap into their home equity, what they'll do is a cash out refinance or they'll take out a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. And all of those are debt options that involve basically taking on more monthly payments. With this, there's there's no monthly payments, and um, you basically just settle up sometime in the future when you sell or refinance or maybe take on some additional debt. So, I guess James, my my initial response to this is, how is it different than a reverse mortgage? Because it sounds kind of similar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there there are definitely some similarities there. There's no age restriction the way that uh, reverse mortgages uh, have. And kind of looking into the future, it, it can really, you know, the amount that you end up settling up with the uh, home equity investor can really depend on how much your home appreciates in the meantime. So there's kind of more variability there in terms of uh, what you might actually uh end up paying back in the future. How do you think this approach compares to other forms of investment in terms of risk and return? You mentioned, you know, investments and in, uh, interest rates and bringing on more payments when it comes to using a home equity line of credit. But this sounds a little bit different. I mean, there definitely are some some big risks here. I mean, you're giving up a pretty sizable chunk of your home's value sometime yeah. in the future. And so, um, you know, the critics that I talk to of this investment basically say it's it's complicated and homeowners might not really understand what they're giving up here. And so, um, you know, that that's something to consider is, you know, you really don't know where home prices are going to be in 10 or 20 years. And if you have an investor who owns the 20% stake in your home, that could end up being a lot more than maybe you anticipated. Could, could you end up finding yourself sort of owing more than the house is worth at the end of the day? That seems like a possible scenario if the home values don't increase. 
So right now, what we see with uh, investors who are working with homeowners on these types of investments, it's still a, a very niche product. And, um, you know, the vast majority of homeowners with equity are going the traditional route with a, a HELOC sure. or a home equity loan. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think what we're seeing here is that, um, I'm, I'm sorry, could you, could you tell me uh, could you repeat the question there? Oh, we were just talking about, you know, the pros and cons when it comes to choosing mm. this kind of approach in finding new value in your home. And you were saying the cons, you know, were that it's still kind of a new niche product, but any pros when it comes to this new uh, approach to it? Yeah, exactly. So it's still a niche product, but what we see is homeowners who are going with this, they have an urgent need now for cash. So maybe they need to pay off a medical bill, they have some emergency costs, or maybe they just want to clear out other high interest debt that's really weighing de weighing them down and uh, they're stuck with all of these monthly payments. So in that respect, you know, you get this lump sum of cash today and you, you might be uh, set without monthly payments for a little while. James, always great to talk to you. This was a fascinating yeah. topic. For more information on all things real estate, check out businessinsider.com. James Rodriguez. All right, Mitch, we'll send it over to you. Interesting things, you know, getting money these days. Yes. All right, and then there's this. Baseball and hot dogs, they just go together, right? Well, not anymore in Philadelphia, at least. For the past 25 years, the Phillies there actually used to host dollar hot dog night at their ballpark, but no more. Why? Well, those cheap hot dogs actually became meat byproduct projectiles <laughs> when some unruly <laughs> Phillies fans began actually chucking their favorite Hatfield meat during a game last year. There was also oh, a huge boy. demand for those discount dogs at the concourse, and the cramped spaces actually led to security as well as safety concerns. Now, the Phillies officially ended the popular promotion to replace dollar dogs on select dates with a two-for-one deal at two April games at Citizens Bank Park. The team said that the change was made, quote, based on the organization's ongoing commitment to provide a positive experience <laughs> for all fans in <laughs> attendance. So no more of those dollar hot dog nights. And I know, Jackson, you, you lived in uh, uh, L.A. for yes. a while. Um, when I was in Oklahoma City, uh, the Dodgers, one of their, uh, their farm teams, was based there. It was the yep. Oklahoma City Dodgers. But they also brought in the Dodger dog. Did you ever have? Really? Did you have a Dodger dog? You ever oh, had? oh, yeah, Dodger dog. And then, of course, in Los Angeles, Pink's hot dog is its Pink's, own that's thing, right, yeah. right? But the Dodger dog is legendary. It's like you can't go to a Dodger game without having a Dodger and, dog. And, and I had a hard and fast rule for the longest time: hot dogs, because now, unless I, they're pure uh, sausage, you know, hot dog. Because again, no one knows what goes in the hot dogs. Seriously, <laughs> no one knows. Uh, and the government's even actually cool with it. Like, we're allowed a certain amount of unknown objects to go into a hot dog. Yes. Well, you give a Philly fan anything, they're going to throw yes. it. Yes, remember that. Matt was talking about how they were throwing batteries at Santa one time. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I, I, I had to try a Dodger dog. Wasn't bad. I, yeah. I, I, but the whole time I was thinking, what is inside this thing? This what? is more a uh, uh, commentary on Philly's fans. I than think it you're is. right. <laughs> Hot dogs in general. Indeed. It's National Women's uh, Heritage Month, and we are talking boss ladies and somebody who's changed the world of animation when we return. This week's Boss Lady, we not only celebrate Women's History Month, but we also recognize a true boss lady who set the precedent for animation design at Disney. Check out this week's tribute to an amazing boss lady named Mary Blair from our friends at Disney+. Plus. Mary Blair had brought her style into these films. She was just a very bold artist. She had impacted all of us. I think she's a legend. <laughs> she made history. Hello everyone, I'm Lorelai Bové. I'm the Associate Production Designer on Encanto. In honor of Women's History Month, I'm really excited to celebrate the work of Mary Blair. She's a concept artist and designer for such Disney animation classics as Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. So a concept artist or a visual development artist, our job is to support the story visually. In Encanto, I was in charge of designing the, the worlds, you know, the environments, uh, and also creating characters and their costumes, creating color scripts, sort of like our way to write the story with color. Mary Blair is known for her vibrant art style, her use of color, and a look and feel in her work that continues to make an impact at Disney animation today. She comes up in every single movie. Someone in the room will bring her up as an example 
A great place to start when looking at Mary Miller's influence is her work on the beautiful film Cinderella. Like the style of Cinderella is pretty much Mary Miller's style, which is so cool to see on a lot of her paintings, especially this one, where you see the props are a little more stylized, you know, and uh, have a lot of whimsical rhythm. It's not just what they used to do in other films at Disney. You barely see concept art that is translated directly to the movie, so this is an example. It really portrays the same image in the movie. To me, it's like a celebration of the concept art. In Alice in Wonderland, Mary Blair had also a huge influence. The stylization is uh, very, very Mary Blair. It really supports the story. I love this piece of Mary Blair. Like to, to me, it's very theatrical. It's just like so fun to see how simple she evoked uh, that lighting scenario. This concept art was pretty much translated into the film. As is, uh, I love the composition. I think it's genius, you know, how it really supports the story of Alice, you know, being so curious and peeking through the handles of the teapots, uh, looking at the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. With Peter Pan, I would point out her color work. This piece uh, is so bold uh, just by the use of uh, color. Like the sky is green. I mean, I love how she just makes very powerful choices. Part of the uh, color choices here, like the ship is like red and it really stands out against the green. You know, they're complementary colors. So uh, of course it's gonna be very vibrant and it's gonna sing. And then you feel those dark shadows uh, on Captain Hook and Smee. Another thing that I really like with her work is just the blunt use of black. You know, she uses that a lot. And I think, uh, you know, it adds so much to that drama and that theatricality. She really broke the mold in animation. It was something that we had never seen before. And thanks to her, you know, she has inspired us all. It was interesting where all the films that I, I gravitated to usually was just the colors. You know, especially from Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella and Peter Pan. I didn't find out about her until later in my career when I was studying at CalArts and someone pointed out your color work, it looks almost like Mary Blair. And I was like, Mary Blair. And then I started looking to her and I was like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. Like, that's why, you know, gravitated to those. And now I knew the artist. It was very inspiring to see her, you know, as a woman working back in the fifties, you know, and be able to have a, a voice, have such a big influence in those movies. And she still has an influence today, everywhere in the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Watch all these amazing Walt Disney Animation Studios movies streaming now on Disney Plus. And happy Women's History Month. Blair passed away at the age of 66 in July of 1978. In 2022, a mural of Blair was unveiled in her hometown of McAllister, Oklahoma. It features Blair surrounded by vines and a gold stopwatch in reference to her work on Cinderella and Alice in Wonderland. It's located on the side of the Honey Bean Boutique in the city's downtown shopping district. If you're a boss lady or you know someone who you think should be or recognized on the show, drop me a line at Andrea at dailyflashshow.com. Stay with us, much more news and entertainment to come. Life Love Shopping is a weekly 30-minute lifestyle show hosted by Andrea Jackson. It's focused on the latest trends for your health, home, and happiness. Life Love Shopping offers viewers ways to improve their life and style, wellness, and relationships. If you live it, love it, or buy it, Life Love Shopping will talk about it. We start today's show with the happiest jobs in America. A recent study found physical therapists take the top spot when it comes to job satisfaction. Life Love Shopping, your life and style guide from A to Z. This is Daily Flash with your hosts, Andrea Jackson and Mitch English. Trending news and entertainment. This is Daily Flash. Hi, everybody. I am Mitch English. I'm Andrea Jackson. This is Daily Flash, your source for trending news and entertainment. A little uh, inside baseball here. Uh, we get, like, what we're going to talk about on the show today. And uh, Ozzy printed out all our, our scripts and everything like this, and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> 
the la landscape. Right, landscape. Yeah, you're it, vertical. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a ver yeah, and I'm like so portrait. You, I guess I should it's say. Yeah, weird. It's different. It's very different. Go with it. Uh, hey, check this out. Uh, if you want to find the truth out uh, to anybody, okay, do it early in the morning. Like if you want to find out, like if you want to talk to somebody and you want to, you know, listen, you maybe we're kind of wondering if you're going to get the, a straight answer or not, do it in the morning. Really? There's a new, uh, there's research out from the Harvard and University of Utah that says people that are a are actually less honest after lunch, less honest after lunch. Believe it or not, I need to tell you what. Less <laughs> honest. We were doing that this morning. Less so. honest. They after say lunch. because uh, you, your self restraint is actually uh, stronger in the morning hours because your energy is a little bit higher. You had some sleep and everything. Oh, and so sure. when 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 you get a little bit older uh, later in the day, you're just like I, I, I I'll, I'm gonna just protect myself and I'll, I'll, I'll lie or whatever and that sort of thing. Oh, and your battery starts to drain down and you're less ethical in the afternoon. So less <laughs> ethical in the afternoon. What, the, what they're saying, Harvard. And University of Utah. So I don't know. Try that or, or whatever. Now we know <laughs> our New York friends when they call the California friends. Uh, uh, maybe they're more honest when it's usually the other way around. Uh, when New York people will tell you exactly what you yeah. need to hear. Could that explain afternoon delight? It, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, it could. Uh, yes. I'll write that down. I'll do some research on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Although they're called the friendly skies, jet setting off into the clouds can sometimes <laughs> result in a bumpy ride. However, when trouble is brewing, there is one go-to position for flight attendants who claim it's a lifesaver. Take a look. Ever wondered why cabin crew sits like this during takeoff and landing? It is called bracing position. This position involves fastening seat belt securely, sit upright, sit on hands, palms up, thumbs tuck, and arms loose, and feet flat on the floor. The aim is to keep the body in a rigid pose so that if there was any impact from an unplanned emergency, the body is damaged less. Well, online critics were stunned by the shocking revelation many empathize with the dangers of a job that involves constantly preparing for a crash. I mean, you do kind of take flight attendants, I think, for granted because yeah. you don't realize how involved they are and, and what they could be in, in the moment of emergencies. And how many, how many people, if you think about it, they if, so think of a full flight and how many people they're kind of, uh, if you broke up, there's usually, what, four or five uh, flight attendants and everything, yeah. and how many people they're actually kind of responsible for if you look at it that, that, that way and how we don't really pay attention to them. I think they get... A lot of times, you know, you, you, because we've seen so many stories of people that are traveling and you just lose all sense of decorum <laughs> and they have to deal with that. And all they're like, look, I'm really here just to make sure that if anything ever happens, you guys can get off this yeah. plane and go, I'm going to give you some drinks or, and some crackers yeah. as well. But it's a job. It's a, gla it's a glamorous job. It used to be much more glamorous than what we see today, but still, it, they're there for our safety. Have you ever been to the TWA terminal? I've heard about it, and you were telling me, and I was so jealous about it. You, you got to go gotta check it out. You gotta go at JFK. It's the old 1960s TWA terminal, and it is the coolest thing. If you've got a long layover, you can walk over and check it out, and if you stay at the TW Hotel on site at the airport, okay. you can also tour it, but um, if you saw that movie, if uh, Catch Me If You Catch Can, me can yeah. there's a scene of them walking down that aisle that yeah, red carpet, exactly, uh -huh. that's exactly where it was shot. But it's beautiful. And that's how they, back in the day, that's how they treat They yes. were like, yeah, pilots would sign autographs and everything. It was something really, really cool and people would dress up. I, I think Virgin, I guess, would probably be the closest to, yes. to what were that that day. I would I would fly yeah. an airline to say, "Look, we have a dress code. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna treat oh, you like we did right? back in the '50s." And you know, I would want the airplane to be newer, but uh, then I'd yeah, fly. Well, yeah. the Remember yeah. the one th thing we saw on a plane that was definitely not proper decorum. Oh, oh. <laughs> we can't talk about it, but it was on the way to Vegas. It was, okay. It was it was it was like the raunchiest stuff ever. It was like, okay, well, this is happening. I, I yeah, well, uh, which is a whole bringing podcast. Bringing it back to the TWA terminal there. Was they've got these beautiful flight attendant uniforms yes. that were done by designers like Yves Saint Laurent and I mean at Givenchy, it's amazing to see how flight attendants dressed back in that day. It was something that yeah. it was something that not, you didn't get to do very often, yeah. so you it was a big event. Yeah. I wish we kind of went back to that. I know. We will stay dressed the way we are, so hopefully you like it. But we'll be back after this. Welcome back to Daily Flash. Here's Fabian Marcano with this week's The Beat. Well, Adidas has made an official Bob Marley version of the Adidas SL72. While Bob Marley and Adidas never collaborated officially, the two always shared a connection with Marley often rocking Adidas apparel and sneakers. 
There have also been a number of releases that pay homage to the late reggae star. To make this partnership official, the Bob Marley estate has now collaborated with Adidas to release a special edition SL72. His signature is embossed on the heel in gold script and his name and image are printed on the tongue. The choice of model of the project may have been inspired by this 1976 picture of Marley rocking those exact shoes. Also in the news, Jennifer Lopez. J-Lo has a new movie. It's This Is Me Now. It has big stars among guests, but it could have been totally different if others uh, were, were accepted. The star recounted several casting details in her new prime documentary, uh, The Greatest Love Story Never Told. She says she and her team first reached out to big stars like Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande, but Tay was busy with her heirs tour and Ariana Grande was filming Wicked in London. That wasn't all. Khloe Kardashian was also part of it. Jason Momoa, Jennifer Coolidge, Lizzo, Vanessa Hudgens, and even Snoop Dogg stopped by because they weren't really available. And SZA, Bad Bunny, and Anthony Ramos were also on the A-list stars who decided to pass. Imagine what it would have been like or what it would have looked like if all of these people were signed into the cast though. At least she bounced back with uh, an assembled all-star team including Sofia Vergara, Jane Fonda, and Trevor Noah. It's not that bad. <laughs> Also in the news, Pharrell has called upon the Tyler, Tyler the Creator to design a capsule collection for Louis Vuitton. The collection is set to launch in March of the 21st of March. Pharrell and Tyler have worked together for years. Pharrell's vocals and sonic fingerprints can be heard across Tyler's discography. discography. And Tyler most recently contributed a verse on Pharrell's 2022 single, Cash In, Cash Out. But the collection marks their first truly fledged uh, fashion project together. I think it actually looks pretty nice. I would I would probably steal a couple of one of those shirts. It looks pretty good. Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Johnson, Bad Bunny, and Jennifer Lawrence among additional 2024 uh, Oscar presenters. It's actually pretty interesting this list that they have. The 2024 Academy Awards was yesterday and hosted by Jimmy Kimmel. This year, five past winners introduced the current nominees in all four acting categories. It was hugely popular format that the Academy first and last tried at the Oscar ceremony held 15 years ago, and many Oscar lovers have begged the Academy to bring it back since then. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer led this year's nominations with 13 nods, followed by Yorgos Latimo's uh, Poor Things with 11. Uh, Martin Scorsese, Killer of Flowers in the Moon with 10 and Greta Gerwig, Barbie with 8. Also, Apple Music, this is a very interesting one, is leveraging a partnership with the third-party service SongShift to enable users to move music libraries and playlists from other streaming platforms, such as Spotify, Tidal, and YouTube Music into the Apple Music app for Android. This allows users to transfer their favorite playlists from other streaming services into Apple Music. The integration aims to simplify the process for users to switch their music collection to Apple Music from other services. The feature is currently in the early testing phase and available to a limited amount of people and Android beta users. I think I'm going to be a part of that if I could switch a couple songs with my Android people, my green message kind of people. <laughs> but that's going to be coming up very soon and a lot of more information right here on Daily Flash. And don't forget to catch me on Daily Flash Latino. Check out their website, dailyflashlatino.com, to find your local listings and times. We'll have more coming right after this. actually hits home for millions of people all across the country. Here is the question. How does having kids later in life, say like uh, in your 40s, actually affect your parenting skills? The story actually comes from an essay by John My Mayer. Meyer. Uh, he says that his parents, both in their 40s, didn't seem interested in parenting and he actually felt unwanted. Doctors told his mother that she was too old to have kids Ooh. when she found out that she was pregnant with him. 
Meyer was 16 when his father died, and this experience influenced his decision not to have children later in life. So the question for the panel is, is it wrong for people to have kids later in life? Does it do better? That sort of thing. I know uh, uh, I, I, being the father on the set, yeah. I have a, a certain uh, way. But here, Matt, you know, uh, you're going into a, a, a marriage here. You guys, I know, have been talking about kids. Is it, do, yeah, do, what no, do you for think, sure. Matt? I mean, you and I actually had this talk on a, on a road trip one time that, you know, I would have been a horrible father if, <laughs> if I'd have had kids younger. My dad actually had me when he was 40. Uh, I'm almost 40. So, I mean, we're looking to have kids and I think I'd be actually a better parent now than if I'd had a kid 10 years ago, it would have been a disaster, absolute disaster. Yeah, and you know, now Jackson, I know you have uh, many friends, me included, obviously, yes, that have yes. kids. And, um, you know, back in the day, uh, how, hey, we're having an event. I'm like, well, I can't go. I, <laughs> I got kids. <laughs> no, I can. But you know, I mean, what your thoughts on this? Well, I think um, I know parents of both, like that had kids right out of the gate when they were in their early 20s, and now they're in college, or some are even married, some are even grandparents at this point, which is shocking. Um, and I know some people who waited later in life, and I think the people who waited later in life are more content because they're a little bit more settled. They've got more money. They're more comfortable. Yeah. So there isn't this rush to try and do everything That's and to to try and make ends meet because that's the tough part but I also think it's a mistake if you wait too long because then you're limiting your amount of time you that are. you have raising your kids no you're right and uh, just like John Meyer said you know uh, he lost his dad and yeah. that comes along with it you're not gonna have as much time but I also feel that you, because you don't have as much time you want to do a better job before you die you know what I'm saying yes. I can understand that uh, and that conversation came up to where I think I'm a better parent today uh, after the frontal lobe uh, uh, you know, develop. I was 21 when I became a, uh, my youngest so is 24 young. and it's so weird to me. Anyway, we'd love to know your thoughts. Flash at dailyflashshow.com. The design world is buzzing about KBIS, the kitchen and bath industry show. The design world recently came together in Las Vegas to show off their latest trends. Here's lifestyle editor Joanne Butler with more. Hey, Joanne. Oh, hi. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start in the heart of the home, the kitchen. Luxury appliance brand Signature Kitchen Suite announced its new transitional series, marrying gourmet cooking technology and high-end sophisticated design. It includes these gorgeous 30-inch double wall ovens with innovative AI technology using a built-in camera, literally able to identify ingredients you have on hand and can automatically suggest optimal recipes using Wi-Fi connectivity and their Think Q app, really for true foodies and culinary aficionados. The camera can also help remotely monitor what you're cooking in real time, take pics, even time-lapse videos that you can share with your friends and family. Uh, then this oven has confection cooking, but also has a steam sous vide mode that makes things moist and tender on the inside and crispy flaky on the outside. Just truly chef style cooking here. Uh, they have InstaView windows too, so you can knock twice and you can see perfectly without having to open the door. I love that. And part of the transitional design, the oven comes in a satin stainless steel, has slim handles and a seven inch LED touchscreen for just this sleek modern look. Uh, and of course, this is the show-stopping Signature Kitchen Suites 48-inch French door fridge with a convertible refrigerator freezer drawer, just unmatched versatility here. And then this is the French door configuration that people just love for entertaining. It's huge. It's fantastic. Now, next up, cabinets. This is Fabiwood, the number one semi-custom cabinet makers. They just consistently surpass industry standards with one of a kind beautifully handcrafted cabinetry really known for their quality and durability that will last you a lifetime and that's what you want when you make this kind of investment just beautiful attention to detail here this is the natural timber wood just gorgeous they've paired it with black absolutely beautiful and then of course white cabinets are going nowhere this is their onyx frost just a unique white uh, but they're also showing a ton of really new and beautiful designer colors like this teal and green i love it also a lot of traditional shaker styles but with a modern twist. Now, other design touches we're seeing, a lot of interesting pull handles, lots of natural elements like woods and leather pulls, also beautifully veined countertops, a little bit darker colors like you see here, but very natural looking. Uh, also unique shelving, look at this with a roping, just so cool, and a little bit thicker shelves, about two inch thick. I mean, look at this, just absolutely beautiful. I love the ladder. And there you have it, trends from KBiz. All right, award season, it's over, but the Oscar buzz still going strong. Distinctive 
Assets came up with the Everyone Wins gift bags for this year's nominees. And joining us right now is Lash Ferry. Lash, thanks so much for joining us. We want to know what exactly everyone got in this Everyone Wins gift bag. This is an extraordinary consolation prize for those who didn't get to take home an Oscar. And let's start with the most expensive item. There is a $50,000 vacation for them to the Swiss wow. Alps from Chalet Zermatt Peak. If they're feeling more beachy for their vacation vibes, they can go to the crown jewel of the Caribbean, St. Bart's, and enjoy a private luxury villa from St. Bart Paradise worth about $25,000, or stay right here in Southern California for a $24,000 week of mind, body, and spirit renewal from the legendary Golden Door. My favorite part of any gift bag is, of course, the beauty aisle, and we have about a dozen of my favorite products, but we're going to start with Miage Skincare. This is an ultra luxury line. They're getting a $515 set. This line is based on decades of innovation and research. And then, of course, they're able to give back thanks to PETA and their partnership with V Dog. This is a vegan plant powered dog food company that's pledged. 10,000 meals to dogs in need through PETA's Global Compassion Fund. That is incredible. Um, I want to ask you, because I, I noticed that, that you did something a little bit uh, you know, important this year, and that was that you wanted to make sure that you elevated small businesses and even minority-owned business. Why was that so important for you? You know, we've been doing that for a few decades now, actually, and we're so glad that the media is now wanting to focus yeah. on that aspect. Over half of the products in this gift bag are from female-owned businesses, Black-owned businesses, other minority-owned businesses, brands that give back, small purse companies, for example, like Elbach Couture. Each purse is made by hand. We have these gorgeous red satchels from Overnight Travel Bags, a Black-owned business, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's just so nice to use this platform to elevate those types of brands. You know, it is. And they're the fabric of, uh, of, the, of America. So, you know, getting those small businesses the opportunity to get in the hands of celebrities as well. Can you give me a price tag of what this, uh, the whole bag uh, would, would, would entail? It's $178,000 this year if they take all three trips. Wow, this is awesome. I, I'm waiting. Just wait, I'm waiting for my Oscar so I can get one of those back. Lash, always love having you on. You do a great job. That looks fantastic. And as always, make sure you want to uh, check out and get more information. You can find it on our website. All you have to do is head to dailyflashshow.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Daily Flash. It's time for us to take a look at the lifestyles of the rich and famous as we dive into some celebrity real estate. Let's start with Ellen DeGeneres. Okay. Her stunning Montecito home finally has a buyer. The 66-year-old former talk show host has sold her nearly 12,000 square foot home for $32 million. All right. DeGeneres first purchased the estate outside of Santa Barbara in June of 2023 and listed it for $46 million in October. The property was taken off the market in November and it's got some history. The mansion was built back in 1919. It offers six unique quarters, including the main house, two guest homes, a pool house, art studio, and staff office. Additional luxuries include a wine cellar, a pool, tennis courts, a private garden, and a vineyard. It sits on eight acres of land and offers stunning views of both the Pacific Ocean and surrounding mountains. That's gorgeous. I know Portia, I know they, uh, her, her, her wife, uh, basically is does a lot of the designing yes. inside the house. So, uh, it looks fantastic Gorgeous. inside, really cool. All right, we move on now to the estate known as the Garden Lodge. Now, check this out. This is the former resident, residence rather, of the late Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. lead singer of Queen. It's the first time the property actually has hit the market since Mercury's death back in 91. It's listed as 38 million bucks. The home Ooh. is located in London's upscale Kensington neighborhood. Freddie found the home in 1980, bought it on the spot. The house is the perfect mix of old school architecture meets new world comfort. Mercury used to call his country house in central London. That home. is gorgeous. Isn't that great? Yeah, I mean, where a queen would live. How about yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> and the home where country star Naomi Judd died has just been listed for rent mm. for $15,000 a month. Her family sold the Tennessee property known as the Grand House last summer. It's been empty since 2023. This nearly 8,000 square foot home has four bedrooms, six baths, and features high design style inside and out. It's located about 30 miles south of Nashville. The Grand House is a mix of traditional architecture with craftsman style details. Very nice. Uh, and I know, Jackson, you are such, uh, you're great at the interior design too. 
So much so that she actually posted her <laughs> anniversary of when she got her espresso machine involved, and, which is amazing. Such a moment. <laughs> I go, I got last Jackson, and the crap you had to go to to get that in oh, there. I tell the you kitchen what, looks great. It, uh, yeah, it was it was well worth the wait. You could see if uh, you go follow Jackson on social media, yes. you'll get to see her espresso machine. It's incredible. <laughs> Y'all take care. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you when we look at you. Be good, everybody. Bye. -bye.